Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 197, When Life Imitates Art, an interview with Diane Mills, coming to you on Thursday, May 14th, 2020. You know, sometimes it's been a really long time since you talked to a friend, and the longer it's been, the more you think, I wonder if I... Like, do we still like each other? Do we still like each other as much as we used to? Am I remembering it wrong? And maybe we don't like each other as much as I remember. I mean, it has been a really long time. Maybe we've grown apart or um, the, the connection that we had maybe turns out to be a figment of my imagination. I don't know if you do that, but I do that sometimes, particularly the longer it's been since I've seen somebody and somebody that I really remember having a great time with, liking a lot. Um, Maybe it was a short relationship or a long relationship, but sometimes it's a little nerve wracking to get back in touch because I'm like, oh, maybe it's all in my head. I'll just be like kind and professional. And then less than 60 seconds goes by and I'm like, oh, no, no, I remember this was a connection. I knew it. So that is kind of how it was when I reconnected with Diane Mills. I always think of her as being a friend of my friend. And then I was like, but no, I had a really good time with her when I was with her for a weekend at a writer's event. And then I was like, well, maybe she was just being polite. (laughs) But after talking to her for a couple of hours over the last few weeks, I'm like, no, no, she and I genuinely like each other. She's just totally cool and fun and interesting and... As always, we talked a long time about a lot of writing things. You're going to love this interview. Really, really helpful. And also, the title of the interview should give you a clue. Her new book has very interesting timing on publication. I'll leave that for Diane to explain to you. But anyway, I hope that during this time of um, forced stay-at-homeness for so many of us, you've been able to reach out to some people that you haven't talked to in a long time. People that you remember having a really good relationship with and that you would like to talk to again. I have had more Zoom calls in the last few weeks, which has been great, but it's also been like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of being in front of my computer. Like, I wish I could just see people and hug people. On the other hand, it has been wonderful because some of my friends live way far away and there's no way I'm going to see them or hug them for a really long time. So I've talked to at least two friends in Australia. I'm still trying to get a hold of a friend in New Zealand. Uh, I've talked to some friends in California and Georgia and Tennessee And then my girlfriend who lives here in town that, of course, you know, can't see her either. (laughs) So it's been wonderful. It's been really great. And I hope that you are having some of those experiences. And if you haven't yet, ask yourself, why not? Get a hold of somebody. Ask them if they want to get a video conversation going on Zoom or Skype or something or WhatsApp or whatever it is that you use, Facebook Messenger. And just renew your friendship. You're probably going to be like, that was awesome. I totally forgot. Because the older I get, the more I realize that that's just going to be a thing that happens. I don't get back to Michigan as often as I would like. It's usually at least two years in between visits, and a lot of times it's five or six years or more in between visits. But there's a half a dozen friends or so that every single time we go back, we see them, and I think, oh, you know, it might be, we might be pushing this relationship, you know, trying too hard to make it last from college. But then we get together and we're all laughing and having a good time and nobody's trying to think of a reason to go home early. And I'm like, no, no, these are just people we really like. We will always really like them. So go pursue some of those relationships that you haven't um, really been in touch with for a while. A, give you something to do if you're looking for things to do, but also it just makes you feel good and happy and loved and almost like you're getting a hug. And if you're not a hugger, you know the feeling that I mean, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) But I'm still going to be glad when I can hug people no matter where they are. Um, What are you doing writing wise? Are you doing any writing sprints with friends? I think I told you that my friend Claire and I have been doing some writing writing sprints and we thought about doing it, you know, by Skype or Zoom or something, but then it would pretty much interrupt the fact that both of our husbands are now also home having to work at home. So we decided that we, we would just do it by text. So 
she texts me and says, you know, I'm at my desk and ready to go. And then we do a start time and then we text each other. Okay, stop. How many words did you get? This is what I got. And sometimes a couple more texts. And then we either do another sprint, which because of me hasn't happened a lot lately because I have a bunch of other businessy things that had to be done. Um, or yeah, you just keep going, which is what is going to happen tomorrow. More than one sprint. Yay. I can't wait. <laughs> so definitely like find interesting, fun ways to do that. It might be video for you. I've had sprints where it's like, okay, everybody go. And then all you hear is key keyboard sounds for half an hour or whatever it is. And it's kind of fun. It's like keyboards going. And then if you don't hear your keyboard going, you're like, okay, everybody else keyboards going. I got to keep going. <laughs> so um, there's lots of fun ways to do it. And I strongly encourage you to um, make some time and find some time and uh, get some more writing done with friends. I think that, um, I don't know, doing sprints with friends, for some reason, I type faster, because I know that in a minute, we're going to say stop. Well, from the beginning, in 30 minutes, we're going to say stop. Um, and it's not really a competition. I mean, it's always a little bit in your mind, you're like, oh, I wonder who's going to have the most words. But um, like Claire and I, I'm writing nonfiction and she's writing fiction, which um, for me, the word count is totally different. I can write twice as much nonfiction in any given time as I can fiction because I'm not making it up. I'm just pulling it out of my head. So um, I mean, but if you like to be competitive, then be competitive and be like, okay, well, you got 672 words and I got you know, 547. So next half hour, I'm going to try to beat your word count. <laughs> I mean, you could do whatever works. That's the point. Yeah. So I'm working on the Encouragement for Writers book. And let me just tell you, I'm in one of those frustrating places in the first draft where I'm like, do I know what I'm writing? Because I thought I was writing ABC, but it seems like XYZ is coming out of my fingers, which is weird. And it's not really XYZ. It sort of just feels like it. It's like I meant to write ABC, and what I seem to be writing is BCD. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, mm, okay, don't panic yet. It's only a first draft. And who knows? Maybe, maybe I really am writing a book for an audience that's slightly different than I expected. But We'll see. We'll see how it works out. It's turning out to be a lot more geared towards newer writers, maybe people who don't even have a book out yet. Maybe they've written a book, but they haven't published yet. Um, and my intention was to write a book of encouragement for writers who have several books out. But now, you know, it's um, it's a fabulous job, but it's still a job and you just need encouragement. That's the book I meant to write. So who are you? What do you need? <laughs> what kind of encouragement do you need? Do you need beginner encouragement, in the middle encouragement? Let me know because the whole point is to write the book that you need. <laughs> and I will be creating a survey um, very, very soon, hopefully this week. Um, I've started it. I just haven't actually posted it onto a survey uh, you know, website and put it out there. Uh, so I can ask you then, what exactly do you want in a book on encouragement? Because that's what I want to give you. Well, I think that that is all for me, all the things that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I thought if I talk to you about my writing, it will encourage you on your writing. So I hope that that's working. Um, we're also having very strange weather. So in a way, it's good. On Sunday, it was so warm here in Melma. When I say so warm, I'm talking 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, oh, I never can remember what it is in Celsius. But um it's cold by most people's standards, but for us, for now, it's warm. It's the warmest it's been probably in six months. And we were riding our bikes with t-shirts and oh, it was just so beautiful. And then the next day, Monday, we went out. Oh my gosh, it was like, what happened? It was something like 47 degrees with a wind chill of 37 degrees, which is, that is something like... 10 or 11 degrees Celsius and then like three or four degrees Celsius. Oh my gosh, please spring come back. I'm sorry that I started doing spring cleaning and working on my patio and cleaning my windows. I won't do it anymore if you'll just come back with the warmer weather. So whether your spring is coming and going or whether you live someplace where it's already 100 degrees or you're moving into winter and wishing that it weren't or glad that it is. I hope that you are enjoying whatever weather you have. 
If you wonder why I talk about weather with some amount of frequency on the podcast, it's because weather really affects me. And I think it really affects most people or we wouldn't talk about it so much. Granted, there are times when we just don't know what else to say. But mostly, I think that weather really um, affects me positively, negatively, or whatever. Um, it was just, was it last week or just a couple weeks ago? I was just like, blah, 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 blah to you because the sun was out and I was telling you it was recharging my solar batteries and giving me a ton of energy. So anyway, I hope that you're taking advantage of it and don't, uh, t- don't take it for granted. If you have some good weather, enjoy it, even if it's just a matter of staring out the window and thinking about what you're going to write next or whatever. So, okay, here's the thing. It's time for the interview. So listen to Diane and her fabulous advice. She's been a writer for a long time. She's got a lot of books out, a lot of experience. She works very hard at her craft. And I really hope that she encourages you to push yourself another 1% or 3% write hard, not, not write harder, work harder, learn more, focus, think about how you can make this great sentence better, this great paragraph better, this great story idea better. Like, it's wonderful having a friend like her who's always really pushing to try to do it better and better, better than the last time, better than the last time. You know, we can't always succeed that way. Sometimes we have a book that's like, oh, that was so good. And then it's hard to like bring bring the next two or three up to that level. But on the other hand, if we didn't try at all, Mm. (laughs) imagine where we'd be. So I hope that one of the things that you get from Diane is encouragement to really work on your craft. I hope that you enjoy it. That's the whole point. But don't just enjoy it, like work at it. All right, I'm going to let her give you more ideas on how you can do that. Personally, I think the work is really fun. I love reading craft books, reading what other authors are um, suggesting that I do because it's worked for them. And uh, that's why I do the podcast too. I want to give you ideas about things that have worked for other writers and maybe they'll work for you. Definitely throw out the things that don't work for you. (laughs) But hopefully you'll always be finding something where you're like, ooh, I'm going to try that. Okay, so without further ado, further ado, hmm, maybe I'm thinking about wedding books. Uh, I do write romantic comedy, so okay. Normally, this would be the sort of time when I'd be like, let's just edit that out, but I'm not going to. Without further ado, (laughs) here's the interview with Diane. Have an awesome day. Today's guest is Diane Mills. Diane is a best selling author who believes her readers should expect an adventure. She creates action-packed, suspense-filled novels to thrill readers. Her her titles have appeared on the CBA and ECPA bestseller lists, won two Christie Awards, and been finalists for the Rita, Daphne du Maurier, Inspirational Reader's Choice, and Carol Award contests. Firewall, the first book in her FBI Houston series, was listed by Library Journal as one of the best Christian fiction books of 2014. Welcome, Diane. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. I'm excited. Oh, yay. I'm excited because you're one of my favorite writer friends. Um, Even though we don't really know each other well, the times that we have been together, um, just ridiculously fun. I just, I still can remember being an at dinner with you and your husband and Lorraine Snelling, and I want to say one or two other people in an Austin restaurant, just laughing and laughing and laughing. (laughs) Yes, we were having white queso. Remember? White queso. It was so good. Yes. Yeah. And we were learning lots about writing too, but I remember the queso. (laughs) Yes, yes. We went to a Donald Moss workshop. Yes. And it was about uh, emotions. And we all walked away with that, just excited, ready to make changes in our stories. It was amazing. It really was. an amazing teacher. Yeah. I never would have believed that um, anyone could convince me that I could take a first draft and instead of just editing it, I could turn it over face down and rewrite it from a blank screen and that it would literally turn out better than the first time I wrote it with edits. Why is it? (laughs) That's amazing. Just super amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I went home and I took his advice and I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
oh, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I'm like, when was the last time I did that? I should do that again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, so Diane, I figure a lot of times it's just more fun and interesting to start at the beginning, kind of, you know, how did you become a writer? What first got you interested? Or how did you, you know, get your first book published? Where did you, where did you start and how did you get to here? That's always a good way to start the conversation. Well, I, I love this this topic because I would not have gotten started writing if my husband hadn't said to me, uh, we'd been married uh, two and a half, three years, I think. And he said to me, stop telling me that someday you're going to write a book. Just quit your job. I'll give you a year to get anything published. Well, I'm not a real big person. And I do believe that dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> so uh, I, um, I said, okay, I will. And I looked at what I was going to do as a full-time job. I knew that I had to keep my rear in the chair. I knew I had to write so many words a day. And back then it was 500. I mean, wow, to write 500 words a day. And I knew I needed to get to writing conferences and get involved in a, a writer's group. I had to read the how-to books and read the bestsellers. Mm -hmm. And that's always been my practice since then. So I wrote that book. I sold it. And it went out the next year. And I never went back to my other job. And Kitty, the funny part about it is now my husband works for me. <gasps> Oh my goodness. <laughs> so is is that not just fun? That's amazing. Okay, I just have to stop and let's just think about this for for a minute, especially for anyone who's listening who's not published yet. You are you, once you decided, you treated it like a full-time job and then you wrote and sold your first book over the period of a yearish. Yes. 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 Wow. And the, the time was just right. It was a blessing. And there is nothing, nothing compared to seeing your first book in print. The cover, uh, the, uh, your name on it, the, the title of the book, it, uh, it is the most exhilarating feeling it, and a, a very much uh, a blessing. Wow. I never had any idea that a career would launch from that challenge, but it has. And one of the things, Kitty, I will say is that when I felt very much that I was called into writing, I also sensed that as, as I learned and developed and grew as a writer, everything I learned, no matter how small, would be shared with a serious writer. And that is another part of those beginning days that I still practice today. Wow. Wow. Okay. That last part that you said shared with a serious writer, what do you mean by that? There are so many people who say, yes, one day I'm going to write a book. Yes. On my next vacation, I'm going to start writing my book. But the truth of the matter is they want the distinction of saying that I have written a book. It's the process, uh, the learning, the continuous learning, the uh, edits, uh, the alone time. Uh, I'm yeah. introvert. Well, I'm halfway down the middle between introverted and extroverted, but a writer has to be content to work in cave mode. Yeah, that it is just you and the computer and your wonderful creativity and imagination just taking off. And if a writer is not prepared for that, it's, it's not going to work. It, yeah. it will be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Um, I think most of my adult life, I've been trying with, trying to, with uh, some degree of um, 10%, 0% to 100% of my heart. Let me just say, really, it's between 0 and 100% um, to be a person who exercises and is fit. Um, and so, uh, let's see, I just turned 52. I celebrated, by the way, my 30th wedding anniversary yesterday. Woohoo! Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I was 
I was posting pictures to Facebook of what I looked like when I was 22 years old on my wedding day when I thought I was fat. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're so beautiful. <laughs> How could you think that about yourself? But I've just never been at all in love with exercise. I accidentally oh. fell into enjoying running after I turned 40. And I, I still really rather like that. Um, I'm, I'm a terrible runner. I'm so slow. But um, I think almost every single half marathon I've run, I've run it a tiny bit faster than the one before. So that's a small thing. But I told my husband yesterday, I said, you know, the thing about exercise is I want to be a person who has exercised. I don't actually want to exercise. And I was, I was kind of like using that thing that, that people say sometimes about writing. I want to be a person who has written a book, but I don't actually want to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that it's important to understand that um, whatever you personally feel, I mean, this is my opinion, whatever you personally feel, it's totally okay. But if you want to be, if you want to be a person who has written a book more than you don't want to be one, then you'll have to be a person who's willing to sit there and do not just the writing, but all the studying and things like you've done. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. And daily. The publishing world changes on a dime yeah. and we have to be prepared for it. So every day I'm reading the how-to blogs, uh, marketing and promotion, everything that has to do with writing. I'm reading uh, every day. Now I've got to say something yeah. about your exercise. I am a huge proponent of exercise and healthy fitness and all those kinds of things. Yeah. And some of my best writing happens when I'm on the treadmill because the neurons are firing and it just seems to be, just seems to go to my fingers from my head and I love it. So while you were talking about mm -hmm. writing and making comparison of, okay, I want to be called a runner, but I don't know if I really want to do the running <laughs> uh, as compared to writing, I'm thinking, but I love exercise. It's a part of me. It's a part of my daily routine. Yeah. And so I have to laugh. Yeah. Well, and I have to, now I have to ask you, so do you have one of those treadmill desks? I do not have a treadmill desk, but my treadmill fits in this little, um, on this, it props up against my treadmill with a yeah. little lip on it. And so I can do it that way. Um, so you type, yeah. you, you type and walk. Yes. Uh, I, I actually would like to do that. I, I don't have room in, in this particular place that I live right now. And I, I once tried to rig, um, I don't know if they still do this anymore, but you know, if you go to a baseball game, there'll be the guys with the trays of popcorn walking around and it's like a, a big strap on their neck connected to like a wooden box. Yes. Sort of something like that. So I, I like handmade something like that for my laptop, trying to see whether or not I could, I could find a way to walk and type. Um, yeah. I, uh, I almost fell over and broke every bone in my body. So I thought <laughs> we're going to stop that, but I, I, I'm sure that it would work for me if I could figure out a way to do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does. And uh, I have the treadmill, I have the elliptical, and I have a stationary bicycle and my weights. And mm -hmm. it's just a part, uh, it's a part of who I am, yeah. um, as eccentric and bizarre as a fiction writer can be. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, I know that I am more creative and I'm more productive when I have my uh, morning exercise out of the way and a pot of coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Diane, I am committing to you right now. I am going to exercise tomorrow. I did not exercise today because I was like, I'm busy and I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it tomorrow morning. All and right. I'm going to email you and tell you that I did it. Okay. I'm your <laughs> accountability partner. <laughs> That's right. And then I'm going to write and see if I think that the writing is any better after exercising. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's a blog post or a yeah. podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either one or both. <laughs> All right. Now, um, you said something a minute ago that I thought this is a great segue. So there's a question I'm dying to ask you. I definitely want to come back to you know, all the fabulous kinds of writing tips that you've um, made your favorites over the years. And, and we'll talk about writing in that. Um, but the reason why uh, today's conversation is slightly bizarre is about your new book, Airborne, which is out in ebook, but is actually nearly a five month early release from its original schedule. Let's just hear the story from you about this. Okay. Airborne uh, is uh, a book of my heart. I had the idea three years before I wrote it and it was written edited and and had its cover by the publisher before COVID-19 came on the scene. So uh, originally I had this thought, wonder what it would be like if a virus was unleashed on board an international flight. Where would it land? Would it be shot down? Well, that's a great idea, Diane, but what are you going to do with it? And I do have uh, a very good relationship with uh, the FBI. They answer all my questions. But I'm looking at medical, and I'm looking at the CDC, and I'm looking at a lot of different things. So I thought about it, but I didn't do anything because I wasn't ready. So stop me at any time with this, but it is... No, um, is yeah, good story. This works? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what happened was I was in Albuquerque and I live in Houston. I was in Albuquerque and I was uh, teaching at a writer's conference. And one of the speakers sat beside me during a meal, introduced herself. And we became, we just kind of hit it off. And I learned that she uh, is a microbiologist and an immunologist and wow. she's Albuquerque's go-to doctor with uh, viruses and things that happen in the area. And she said to me, Diane, I've always wondered what it would be like to have uh, a story about a virus unleashed in a crowd. If you ever want to do this, I'm right here and I'll answer your questions. Oh so, my goodness. Okay. Uh, so I go back home and I'm all excited and I start writing a little bit, and I am a panster. I'm very, very much character driven, but I am a panster. And I said to my husband, I don't know with the airlines that's picked out in my mind, and I didn't want to say which airlines, I, but yeah. I had to have one in, in particular. And so I said to him, I wonder how uh, the flight attendants are trained. He says, oh, that's not hard. And my husband plays piano and he uh, plays at our church and a member of the choir trains flight attendants for the uh, airlines that I was thinking about. Wow. So we had this wonderful conference call and a, uh, he gave me verbiage and procedure and all of those things. And in the meantime, I had talked to my uh, FBI connection, a, a press, uh, a media coordinator uh, out of DC who was just awesome. And uh, she also introduced me to the CDC who just gave me pages and pages and pages of information and scenarios. Wow. So the, the last little bonus was uh, I admired a uh, suspense writer in my area who writes for Baker and Ravel. And uh, he wanted me to become a part of my uh, writer's group. It's a critique group that meets at my church. And we were talking and I said, so what's your day job? He says, I'm a f pilot for XYZ <laughs> Airlines. <laughs> No. And uh, with all that together, I thought, okay, I am supposed to write this, that, uh, that the God who called me to, call, to write is, um, is in this, and I'm going to write it, and I did it, and my publisher loved it, and that's Airborne. And with the COVID-19, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, my book offers hope and uh, a solution. And the what ifs are answered. It was just 
sort of a aha moment when the COVID-19 hit, and yes, it was tragic, and yes, uh, the whole pandemic situation has been tragic. Yeah. But in my heart, I was prepared because I'd done the research oh, wow. with what is go, you know, was going on. So the idea of offering hope uh, in a suspenseful story, a romantic suspense, um, was very, very, uh, it's very satisfying. So the print copy will be out in September and the um, e-copy is out now. And uh, I'm excited. I'm very, very uh, excited. Yeah. And uh, I encourage listeners, if you are interested in uh, Airborne, the e-copy, if you will go to my website, and that's Diane, D-I-A-N-N, Mills, M-I-L-L-S dot com, you can get uh, all kinds of goodies and trailers and all kinds of information like that, if they're interested. Yeah. But uh, that's Airborne. Oh, wow. Okay. First of all, that's just a crazy cool story. I, I mean, know. All of the parts of it are just really interesting and cool, which does kind of make you wonder. I mean, I'm, I'm not one to, um, oh, how do I say this? I'm not one to think the devil's behind every bad thing that happens to me during the day. Um, on the other hand, oddly, I am kind of one to be like, oh, thank you, God, for this thing that, you know, mm-hmm. I'm just going to be like, it probably came from you. Why wouldn't you? You love me. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, so, yes, I suppose um, I'm operating on two different levels with those two ends of the spectrum. But when things come together in a way that's like almost never happens, then I'm always going, okay, what's going on? Help me to pay attention and, and figure out um, if there is something to figure out, which in your case, you know, certainly had to have been just, I definitely need to write this book. All of the tools that I need for it are being presented to me. But then also there's something about, this is how I feel about a lot of um, like thrillers and uh, horror movies and stuff. I think that there is really something to be said for, I want to watch um, the TV version of something, not the documentary version of something, because it, at least in, in the American version of storytelling, which I didn't realize until I moved to other countries, it's just different in other countries. Not everybody has a um, kind of always closed ending. And we tend to have if not happy endings, then it, it, good generally overcomes evil. Bad guys go to jail or, you know, sadly get shot. Or, <laughs> But I mean, yeah, yeah th- th- there seems some sense of justice and closure that is not part of real life. And it's one of the things that I like about um, movies and, and stories like that. And I'm just thinking how amazing that you and Oddly, I've also met at least two other writers who um, their books came out a year or two ago that are also about virus pandemics. Uh, one of them, she actually in her past life um, is a something in the biology field. I forget exactly. Um, and she was like, yeah, I actually published a book like this two years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go read it. But the fact that we're in this very weird situation that mostly we don't know how to deal with. I mean, none of us have had any reason to go to the CDC and study up on like what would happen if and be like, okay, it's all right. People are going to figure out how to take care of this. Um, But to know that there's at least a few stories out there that we can read about something that's similar to what we're going through and that has a satisfying conclusion where things work out, like that's such a blessing. Oh, yes. Yes. I have never had a problem with research that it just is, it was dumped in my lap. Yeah. And uh, granted, I'm very, very uh, diligent when it comes to research. I don't want to turn away a, a, a reader because of an inaccuracy. So I'm very, very diligent about it. But when I've had really difficult problems, the answers have come. And I, I love that. Uh, I love that fact. Love it. Yeah. And it, I, I don't know how you feel about the rest of your books, but this book in particular, like there may be people reading it in the next six months or a year who just needed to have 
that particular story that had hope as a part of the story, that mm-hmm. story, the one about a contagion. Mm-hmm. And, and yes. you get to be a part of helping people to feel like, okay, it's all right. It's going to turn out okay. Yes. Yes. I believe in a satisfactory ending. It isn't necessarily um, happily ever after because that's not real life. Yeah. But as you said before, the justice, the closure, this is how it ended. Uh, that's what I want. Uh, yeah. I believe in uh, reality, reality in uh, relationships, reality in making life uh, a safer place to be. And I, I want to show that. I don't want to be, what is the, the cliche? Gloom and doom. I don't want <laughs> yeah. to do that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Or to be, you know, sugary, sweet, and unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. That, there's a place for that. But that's not a Diane Mills book. Yeah. If, if yeah. that makes sense. I have to say that um, your covers tend to be just really, really good. The cover itself, you're going, well, there's already action happening. And I haven't even gotten, you know, past the cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyndale does a fabulous job with my covers. And there's never been a cover that I was not pleased with. And, right. and sometimes that that happens, you know, we have have to be honest about that, but Tyndale's covers are very, very, uh, they pick up that psychological aspect or that glint of something in somebody's eyes or the shadows or the, the, the use of color to create that mood. Uh, and I love that. Nice. Ah, yeah, they're good. Just in case anybody who's listening from Tyndale, good covers. (laughs) (laughs) So, all right, let's talk about the writing portion a little bit. Um, this particular book, not a good example of having to dig through research, (laughs) but, um, it's actually a great example of all the different kinds of things that you might find that you need in a story. Now, um, you've been writing long enough and you've been writing, um, books with like FBI characters long enough that you've developed some connections of your own to at least one person in the FBI. You, you had this accidental sitting next to somebody who is a, um, I already forget the word. Um, She's a, the immunologist, immunologist. And, a micro, and microbiologist. Yes. Yeah. Um, but let's say that uh, you had had the idea, hadn't met her, and was thinking, I probably really need to talk to somebody who knows anything about viruses. So, and, and I'm speaking like from, from the listener who's listening right now going, I don't even know how to find a so-and-so. Give us some ideas about how you find the kind of research that you need. First of all, I go to Google, and I look on the websites that are respected. Uh, the, um, the press, uh, the media coordinator, I say press, but actually it's media coordinator, of any organization, any federal organization or um, colleges and universities, they are geared to answer questions from the public. Uh, for example, none of the uh, law enforcement agencies, they don't want to be viewed as bad guys. Neither do they want to be viewed as behaving as we often see in TV and, and movies. And so if I can go right to the source of someone, then I know I'm going to get the answers I need. In regards to airborne, I, my first Um, call would have been to my doctor's office and ask who they recommended. Uh, They're not going to recommend anyone that's that who is not professional or who does not make them look professional. So that would have been my first call. Uh, The CDC, I would have picked up the phone and called and called them if not for the uh, FBI person giving me an inroad. Uh, But uh, I, you know, one of my books was about a, a, a Texas marshal. So my, an FBI friend put me in contact with the media coordinator of that particular organization. The, the, the biggest tip that I can give a writer is, number one, most of us are introverted. So the idea of picking up a phone and, and calling someone can be a bit frightening. But if we want that credibility, 
in our stories, we've got to do that. Uh, so Google, pick up the phone, go right to the source. I will say that the funniest call um, I ever made uh, was to the uh, CIA in DC. And uh, a fellow answered, I told him who I was and what I needed. And, you know, talk about ho-hum, was not interested in talking to me. And I can understand that. And so finally he said, would you give me a moment? So I waited and I waited and I waited. And finally he came back and he said, you still there? I said, yes. Did you go to the, to the person in the next cubicle and say, I don't know what I did that I deserved this call this morning? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> He, uh, he laughed and it broke the ice, but there really wasn't a whole lot he could tell me. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a book I wrote some years ago uh, about the uh, Border Patrol, uh, called them in, uh, in D.C., and they arranged for me to have three days with the Border Patrol in McAllen, Texas. Yeah. So you never know uh, how you're going to be blessed with all this information, but I know that because of forming those relationships, I get to understand and learn a little bit more about their personal lives, who their friends are, what they like about their job, what they don't like, uh, more of their background. And, and it helps make uh, stories a little more believable yeah. because you're talking about real people. Yeah, I have to say, I noticed that in Airborne where... Um, I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm trying to figure out um, what I can say to make sure I don't accidentally give anything away. Um, so I will not say it specifically. Um, the main character um, has a medical condition that um, in TV shows that I've seen, I mean, it was, was never really um, anything that anybody was rude about, but um, rarely... Can I, I honestly cannot think of a time where I have heard one FBI agent say to another agent with this medical condition, um, well, make sure you take care of yourself first. I'm like, what? <laughs> but I was thinking, <laughs> but it sounds like a normal thing that a human being would say to another human being. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, well, I, I really like this. And now I like the character better too. I'm like, oh, she has a good boss. Oh, I wonder how he's going to play into this. <laughs> Yeah, they are, uh, they are remarkable, remarkable people. I belong to the FBI Citizens Academy um, and took their course some years ago and belong to this organization. And periodically we have these fabulous, fabulous speakers that, oh, you know, I wish I could record things, but you can't take your phone into the meetings. And then... Um, Let's see, this is 2020, uh, a year ago, March, I guess that was 2018, 2019. Oh, well, whatever. I took <laughs> um, uh, an ATF course, Citizens Academy ATF course. Wow. And uh, they don't do so much with alcohol and tobacco, but they sure do with firearms and bombs and things of that nature. And again, they periodically have uh, the agents come in who have work specific cases. And um, that's always amazing. Uh, listening to them, getting to know their personality a little bit and, and where their heart lies uh, for people in the position they feel. Wow. Oh, that sounds so interesting. So I would think that sometimes... Um... Well, I don't know. My mind is always like, I think up another story and another story while I'm listening to other people's stories. I don't, have, you, have you come up with sometimes with your like, I got to gotta figure out where I can put that in a book sometimes when you're oh, listening? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I'll make notes. This is, oh. you know, in a file that this needs to go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so many of my friends, they, they know that, um, that I would... I would never really use their story, but, but if they tell me something, I might turn around a little bit and use it somewhere. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, we are so guilty. Where was I at? Not, well, it was probably the last conference I taught at before the COVID-19, and this gal coughed, and it sounded like it came from her, to from her toes. And uh, somebody said something about it, and she turned around and she said, well, I'll be quiet when I die. And oh. I thought, oh my. So I wrote down that line 
And somewhere I've got to use that because it was just hilarious and I was not expecting it from this person. And so, yeah. yes, I'll use it. That's awesome. I'm trying to remember. There's this one woman. Um, I, I'm trying to, it would have been such a small part. I honestly cannot remember. I might've already put it in a book, but when I was a teenager, my mom and my sister and I uh, were in Kmart. And, you know, they had the blue light special and we yes. saw the Kmart employee with the blue light. She was getting ready to set something up that was going to be on sale, you know, in the next few minutes. And, um, and she had this brilliantly purple hair. Um, and this was, my gosh, so I was a teenager. This was the 1980s. I didn't really see very many people in our little tiny town with any color hair that besides regular hair colors. Mm -hmm. And so she really kind of stood out to me. And then, um, and I was only like one clothing rack away from her. And I heard this sound, choo, choo. And I looked over and she had sneezed. And that's what she looked like and sounded like. She just, choo. And it was this really high pitch. And it was all I could do to remember my manners and not laugh out loud. <laughs> but I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this must be put somewhere. Oh, yeah, because it was so unexpected. You would expect purple hair to have a big gush. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. All right. Now, I know that there's a lot of listeners going, I see your point, Diane. I just need to pick up the phone and call. Um, mm -hmm. But is an email good enough? Sometimes. Um, but it's never like a phone call. Because when you get a phone call, you get a personality. Right. And not everyone can trans translate into words uh, how they feel about something. You know, we use that word passion a lot. I have to laugh when I hear that because I'll say, oh, I'm passionate about writing. And that means, does that mean I'm going to die? I would die for it. <laughs> mm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, I took off on a rabbit trail there. But the idea of a voice, whether it be a man or a woman, uh, who works in a position the same as your character. There, there's something in their tone and their word choice that you just cannot get in an email. So the people working as media liaisons aren't just administrative people in a secretarial pool. These are people who probably have worked Okay, I did not really understand that, that they actually might have done the job at some point or are doing the job and they're just assigned this as like an extra thing that they take a turn oh. doing or? Uh, both. Uh, wow. Your media coordinators, let's say for the FBI, chances are they work some of one of the divisions or more than one of the divisions before they uh, step into that position. But the truth is they have to know about all the divisions. Oh. They have to understand uh, and, uh, and know personally the agents who are working within their office or outside the office. And they have an awareness that you and I don't have. Uh, so not only do they have to make sure that the media uh, hears correctly what is going on in the FBI's position, they have to know about the case itself and the agents who are working it. Right. So the, uh, the knowledge is, in, is incredible. Okay, so the next question that I hear somebody who might, you know, sound a lot like me <laughs> is, okay, I know I need to call, but honestly, I'm just a writer. It's just a made-up story they're not really going to want to waste their time with me, are they? Oh, my goodness. All right. If I met you for the first time, Kitty, and I said, what do you do? And you, well, I'm a writer. Let's just use that, not, or a podcaster, or uh, I teach writing. You would be so excited to tell me about your job yeah. because you adore it. You love it. Oh, and the going. majority of these high profile jobs like we're looking at, these people are excited and they just can't believe that somebody is interested in what they're doing. Just like when someone says, oh, you're a writer. Right. And, uh, you know, I have to laugh because sometimes I, I see dollar bill signs in their eyeballs and <laughs> we know that's not true. <laughs> but um, people want to talk about 
what they're excited about, what they spend most of their hours doing, what they are passionate about. And so it's, it's not that they don't want to talk to us. They adore it. Uh, there may be a time restraint while well, I can only talk for a few minutes or whatever, but they are going to be thrilled that you want to know more about what they do. Yeah, right. Because now I'm thinking about all the people in their lives who are like, stop talking about work and eat dinner with us. And, but now you're somebody who wants to hear about their work. Yes, exactly. And I want to hear everything, even the things you don't enjoy. Yeah. So, yeah. How do you go to the bathroom if you're on a stakeout in the desert? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> I don't know. The first thing that came to my mind was depends. Can I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good okay. one if i ever have to do a stakeout someplace where there's not a bathroom yes. i'm gonna have to remember that <laughs> mm. oh wow okay so this is great so and then please tell me uh, over time do you sort of lose at least um the edge of that feeling of i don't want to call i mean we may always kind of feel like oh have I, i've just got to do it but uh, does the doing help you to kind of get over that hump of, no, I, I may not want to, but I'm going to because it'll be worth it by the time I actually get talking. Uh, I love it because I always, I love learning about the personalities. I remember talking to the media coordinator for uh, the, you know, U.S. Marshals here in Texas. And that fellow was so excited about what he does. He says, you're running an FBI story? Oh, they're just rookies. Let me tell you how it's really done. You know, <laughs> just just a character in him, you know, in himself. And uh, I love that, getting to know people, getting to know a female who's in a predominantly male role uh, wow. is also fun. But uh, I don't lo lose that enthusiasm because I know I'm going to find something delicious. Yeah. Uh, to, that I can use uh, in a story. So wow, um, I do do very much enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. So here's another question. Cause I know that some, there's going to be people listening who are like, Oh, thank you. I really needed to know like, how, how do I find somebody in them? What do I say? So um, some of the places that you've talked about, we know that there are media liaisons for them. The FBI, the CDC, large organizations, um, large uh, uh, law enforcement organizations and that sort of thing. Uh, universities obviously probably have somebody who's in charge of that. But what if you have like this really weird thing? I don't know. Um, oh, here, let me, tell you the, let me tell you the other side of the story. You tell me how you would do it. My favorite, favorite writer story um, like I went to a, a signing for Ridley Pearson, mm -hmm. who's a, um, uh, I guess, I don't know if they're mysteries or thrillers. I, sometimes Both. I'm not always sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and he was telling us the story. Gosh, this was when I lived in Phoenix. So it would have been in the 1990s. Yeah. So sometime in that, in that decade, he wrote a book that was um, set in a version of Mall of America that wasn't called Mall of America. <laughs> um, and he needed to figure out something. And now this is me remembering the story from 20 years ago. So, um, but it was something about like how somebody would blow up a mall that, that was that big. And particularly when there's so much security and stuff. So the way that he went about it, and I don't, I really do not remember whether or not he looked for some sort of media liaison at Mall of America to ask them a question and he didn't find it, or if he just didn't really think through some of the ramifications, but he went into various stores and, you know, bought a little thing here and there and asked the clerks, so do you have any kind of um, a policy for safety, like if a bomb goes off? No. Oh, okay. And fires. How does that work if there's a fire? But he, he asked people in like four or five stores until security came and got him and took him downstairs to the basement and held him in a room and asked him a million questions. He's like, I'm a novelist. Go look in the bookstore. My books are in there. <laughs> and, and the way he told the story was brilliant. The way he told the story was as good as one of his books. But, but he did say that afterwards, he was like, I probably won't do research that way again. <laughs> <laughs> so say you need some weird kind of information, there isn't a media liaison for it, and you don't want somebody to, you know, hold you and possibly arrest you for suspected some bad crime. Like, what are some other ways that you might look for information? 
Well, uh, I've written two books. One of my, my very first romantic suspense was about a kidnapping that occurred in a mall. Oh. And what I did, I went right to security. I said, it's okay. probably a safer idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, they gave me all their procedures, their lockdowns, who they'd call, uh, all of those, you know, all of those things. So that helped. One of my books was... Um, I blew up a section of the uh, airport here in Houston, <laughs> and uh, I did, I went right, right to the FBI for that. And then the FBI put me in contact with the mall people and what their procedure would be and where they would set up an office and all those kinds of things. Uh, but I usually just go right to uh, the person at this, you know, at this like when I blew up the airport, um, my husband and I drove into where I knew I would have a van drive in. And uh, so I had it in my mind there. So then I contacted the FBI who put me in charge of their, uh, of the agent who was in charge of their bomb squad. And he told me about what kind of a a bomb, the shattering, what would happen to the people, what they'd hear, body part, I mean, everything oh, wow. more than what I really, really wanted to know. And then uh, how far away they would set up the FBI uh, investigative team. So uh, I'm kind of, let's, let, let me just go to the top because I don't want to be arrested like Ridley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. And do you start out the conversation with, I'm a novelist and I have a question? Yes. And I give them my name and I give them my website. Okay. So yeah. that they, and, and the publishing house, uh, so that they know I'm under contract for that book. Uh, I am published, and this is where you can find more information about me. Uh, you do, you know, the FBI did go through security and clear me, so no matter what I check on online, I know I'm okay. Uh, and the ATF did that too. Okay. So um, that helps. You don't want to be Googling uh, how to make a homemade bomb yes. and <laughs> and have uh, somebody sitting at your front door wanting to know, why are you researching this? Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard stories, um, mostly uh, third hand, fifth hand stories. But one time uh, a woman who's like, no, the FBI came to my house. <laughs> I mm -hmm. didn't know that they knew what I was Googling. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Okay. So really, we just need to think Oh, you know what? So this is how I would do it. This is how I would do it if I were me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I recently hired a business coach for my business and, um, and I love this company. I've worked with them before. They just have such a heart for um, helping people and they're uh, people that they like to help or people who then are hiring them because they have a business where they want to help people or do something for people in some way, you know, teachers or coaches or all sorts of different things. Um, I love the way that they just, um, I love their heart. There's no other way to say it. I love the heart of the company. I love the heart of the individuals. And uh, we were having a coaching call, I don't know, last week or something. And, um, and the, the head guy said something that it was just the way he said it in the midst of the conversation that we were having that just really struck me. He's like, you've just got to stop thinking about yourself because that's where the fear comes from and think about who you're trying to help because that's where your passion is. I'm like, yeah. right. How come I always do it the opposite way? I think about how I'm afraid. I don't want to bother somebody, but instead if I could just be like, this is going to be a great book. It's going to entertain people. It's going to make people like be happy with the feel good ending of I don't know what the feel-good ending is when you blow up part of the airport, but there is one. There is one. <laughs> Somebody gets caught, I'm sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and think about, you know, what the, the entertainment or the help, whatever it is that you're giving your end user, then it would probably be far less scary. Absolutely. That, uh, the, his words need to be on a meme. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be uh, in, incredible to be able to, you know, look at those every day. I'm trying to think of this restaurant that I know that has nothing on the walls, but encouraging quotes. Aww. And um, I really, really do uh, value that. Uh, 
quotes courageous quotes quotes do what my goal is in writing fiction which is to entertain oh wow that was so cute that was so good um and to inspire so if that character had the uh had the nerve and the courage to get those skills and overcome this adversity or find out who is responsible for this tragedy then i can and fill in the blanks yeah. or in, encourage um it, you know if you can just encourage someone uh in your stories then uh, you've accomplished a great deal so I think the same works with quotes. Yeah. If you can inspire, uh, if you can entertain, inspire, and encourage, you've, you've done what you were supposed to do. Oh, I love that. And that's great because, you know, I don't know who all is listening, but um, not everybody is a novelist who's listening. So maybe you're a greeting card writer and you just like the podcast, in which case, thank you. And by the way, I love greeting cards very, very much. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. but a poet or somebody who writes, you know, just articles, just articles are how we learn all the things that we need in order to build the stories we build. Right. Nice. Ah. Oh. Okay, Diane, I know you have a head full of knowledge about writing. We probably should wrap this up real quick. But um, in general, um, with all the different kinds of things that you've written over the years, what are, are there any other tips that you're like, these are also a couple of really good ones that people should keep in mind that have to do with either um, sitting down to write, being that professional that you were talking about in the beginning, or, um, or some tip on research, or just like, your, your best thing that you're like, if you don't remember anything else, this is the thing that, that a writer would need to keep in mind. My head's about to burst. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> let, let me um, reiterate a bit what I said at the beginning uh, of the interview. And that is write every day. Write in the genre that you want to publish read in the genre you want to publish, read the bestsellers like a textbook. Why, why and how is this working? Why am I so captivated by this passage? Highlight it, underline it, all of that. And uh, because I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm saying, yep, and you got to pray about that writing, make sure it's headed in the right direction. So, um, uh, get involved, pay it forward, yeah. get involved in a writer's group, either physical or online. Right now, online is working real well for everyone. Yeah. And uh, reach out to that uh, writer who is just getting started and encourage them. Uh, mentoring is good. Uh, just pay it forward give back so that the next generation of writers can be even better than what this current one is. Yeah, that's brilliant. I like that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Okay. So we need to remind people airborne is out now. If you're, um, if you're an ebook reader comes out in September, if you want to wait to the print book, is that right? Yes. And uh, I will say this, uh, I encourage any of your listeners to sign up for my, uh, my blog post. Uh, it's weekly and it is for uh, readers, not just for writers, but it's for readers. And uh, if you sign up for that on my website, which is dianemills.com, and it's Diane, D-I-A-N-N, -N, my mother wanted an unusual child, and she got one, <laughs> uh, .com. But if you sign up for my newsletter, not only can you download the first uh, chapter of Airborne, and there's a trailer there and it, some fun stuff, uh, but you can also download the uh, first chapter to an ebook that will be out uh, June the 1st called Where Tomorrow Leads. So you can download both of those. Uh -huh. And um, let, me, let me hear from you. You can contact me through uh, my website. And, uh, you know, this world of writing, this world period is not about us. It's about others. It's about relationships and keeping people happy and trying to find solutions for problems. So let me hear from you. 
Oh, that is wonderful. I love that. So people can find your books probably in uh, every bookstore that they would normally shop at? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. And yes. your website, does it have the, your uh, social media tags? Oh, my goodness. They're all there. The Facebook, the Twitter, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Goodreads, BookBub, uh, all of them are on my website. So when you go to my website page, all you have to do is click on oh, Pinterest. I forgot about Pinterest. <laughs> and uh, I very, very much enjoy social media. And again, it's not about me. It's about relationships. Awesome. Diane, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been just brilliant. Oh, well, I don't know about brilliant, but it sure has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. Thank you so much. You have a powerful podcast. I enjoy listening to it, and I am always encouraged after one of your um, uh, sessions, your, one of your podcasts. So keep it up. We love you.